Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the October meeting of the Roosevelt Democratic Club. I want to just welcome everyone for uh, venturing out on this wonderful Sunday afternoon. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, as you walked in, there was a sign-in sheet, so definitely make sure that you sign in. Um, we are going to start collecting dues for next year. So if you want to get a head start on paying your dues for 2019, you can do so at this time. Uh, the dues are $10 per person and $5 for our more senior members and our students. <laughs> Um, also, we do have some Roosevelt Club t-shirts. Uh, Lynn, if you want to stand up, she is modeling one of our wonderful club t-shirts with a donkey on the back. Uh, the t-shirts are $10, and we do have a few um, in the back, so see Lynn if you're interested in purchasing the t-shirt. Also on the table in the back, you'll see some jars with a few names on it that you might recognize, like Bernie Sanders or Kamala Harris or Cory Booker or Elizabeth Warren. And that's our little informal poll for 2020. And you can put a penny in the jar as to who you would like to see as our Democratic nominee for president uh, in 2020. So we are definitely taking votes at this time because it's never too early to vote. And speaking of never too early to vote, Early voting has begun. Um, if you have not voted, definitely uh, go out and vote. Early voting will take place until November the 1st. Uh, you can vote from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at any of the early voting sites in Prince George's County. Uh, the closest early voting sites here to Greenbelt is the, there's one over on Good Luck Road, uh, the VFW Hall in Lanham on Good Luck Road, as well as the College Park Community Center um, in College Park, Maryland are the two closest early voting sites to here. So if you haven't voted already, I see Daryl has her I Voted sticker on, <laughs> and Lynn has voted already as well. And so definitely feel free to make sure you vote early. I would say vote often, but we're not Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first thing we always start off is with the Pledge of Allegiance. And so if we can all stand. Okay, and face the flag. All right, we'll start off. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we'll just go right into our guest speaker for the day, because I know he has a very busy schedule. As I mentioned, it is early voting, and so I know he is traveling all across the state <laughs> during this time um, leading up to the November election. And so for those who may not be familiar with the Attorney General of Maryland, his name is Brian Frosch. He grew up in Montgomery County, and before he was elected Attorney General, he did serve in the House of Delegates representing District 16, and then later served in the State Senate here in Maryland, serving District 16 as well. While in the State Senate, he was chair of the Judicial Proceedings Committee, and as senator, sponsored legislation prohibiting the drilling in the Marcellus Shell, as well as um, various other progressive pieces of legislation, especially as it relates to the environment, and especially as it relates to due process issues and things like that here in the state. As Attorney General, he has been extremely involved um, on issues that affect us every day, whether it's consumer protection rights, whether it's issues around um, looking at the way we do uh, bail bonds here in Maryland, as well as joining with various other Attorney Generals across the state um, in lawsuits as it relates to the, against the administration, such as the Muslim ban, um, adding the citizenship question to the 2020 sentence, and the emoluments clause, which is that weird little thing in the back of the Constitution that no one really remembers. <laughs> All right, let's see if that works. Sorry about that. Um, and so he's been extremely active over the last four years as our attorney general, fighting to protect all Marylanders. Um, he is running for re-election. He is running for re-election, and so we definitely want to make sure that you go out and support him. He does have stiff competition that's being heavily funded by the Republicans and by the GOP. And so we need to make sure... And we need to make sure that, okay, and we need to make sure that we support our attorney general. So without further ado, hopefully the mic won't continue to mess up. 
Brian Frosch. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and thank you especially to Nicole, who was a huge help four years ago. I still appreciate it. Um, now I'm afraid it's off again. Let's see. Let's see. No? You have a strong voice, though, so. Can I just shout? Or, <laughs> yeah, you can. Oh, man. OK. Um, when I was running, I, and I know I, I spoke to many of you four years ago when I was running, I said I was running to be the people's lawyer. And I have found the office to be an incredibly effective tool for uh, protecting Marylanders, for uh, improving their lives, and for delivering justice. Is that good enough? Yep. Yeah. Um, over the past nearly four years, we have recovered hundreds of millions of dollars for consumers from uh, predatory lenders, from Wall Street banks, from tobacco companies, and from polluters. We have, I, I created the first organized crime unit in the history of the office. We've indicted and put behind bars some of the most dangerous people in the state. Drug traffickers, human traffickers, um, violent gang members, and uh, gun runners. And we have engaged in a number of uh, public policy initiatives. Nicole mentioned one, which was reforming our bail system. We had thousands of people in jail for one reason and one reason only. They were poor. Mm -hmm. They were charged with minor crimes, shoplifting, urinating in public, trespassing. Bail was set for them. All they had to do was come up with a couple of hundred bucks, and yet there are thousands in, in, of people in our state for whom that's just too much. So they'd sit in jail for mm -hmm. days or weeks or months. And uh, sometimes until their trial uh, came up, most were either, if they were convicted, they were sentenced to time served, or just set free. We reformed the bail system, so that doesn't happen uh, anymore. I can't tell you we've stamped it out altogether, mm -hmm. but for the most part, the judiciary is aiming at, at uh, not putting people in jail for poverty. Uh, I was also the first attorney general in the United States to issue guidelines for uh, law enforcement all over the uh, state saying that discriminatory profiling is illegal. Profiling based on race, on nationality, ethnicity, religion, 
all illegal and can't be used in routine poli police activities. Um, I want to tell you a couple of quick stories about uh, some of our cases. And we'll talk about the White House, then I'll show up and take questions. Um, the first story is about a woman named Vonda, who is from West Virginia. She had advanced stage cancer. Uh, she was in a nursing home in Hagerstown, Maryland. She had lost 40% of her body weight. She weighed about 85 pounds. She had difficulty walking. She had a tracheostomy, so she had difficulty speaking as well. And when she went from Medicare reimbursement to Medicaid reimbursement, they threw her out. And she, at first she said, I'm not going. They said, we're going to call the cops if you're not out of here. So she agreed to leave. They put her in a car with a woman she didn't know. The woman took her benefits card. She had a West Virginia benefits card. They took it away from her and began using it for themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, they put her in a townhouse with a couple of other uh, disabled adults and fed her ramen noodles and water for a couple of weeks. At the, after a couple of weeks, she figured out how to turn off the benefits card. And so uh, when they realized she had done that, they physically abused her and they uh, put her back in the car, drove her to a homeless shelter and dumped her. Um, the homeless shelter saved her life. They, they took her right to the emergency room and the emergency room saved her life. We sued these guys. Uh, we, they are out of business. Uh, we just settled the lawsuit. The owners of this place and the managers of this place have agreed never to do business in Maryland again never be in the nursing home business, never accept another dollar from Medicaid, and uh, they paid the state $2.2 million for the, uh, the bad stuff they did to hundreds of others. Thank you very much. There were hundreds of others situated uh, like Vonda. Uh, I want to recognize that we have our great delegate, Eric Barron, here with his beautiful daughter. Um, <laughs> He does a great job. You're very lucky to have him as a, as a representative. Um, another case that I want to tell you about was about a, uh, a single mom. She had a, a child who was afflicted with cerebral palsy, needed medical devices to help her walk, uh, had cochlear ear devices so, because she had a hearing disability as, as well. The mom, they needed to move. So the mom hired a moving company, Best Offer Movers. And Best Offer Movers gave her an estimate, as they're required to do under Maryland law, 350 bucks. Uh, she said, okay. They came, they loaded everything up onto the truck, the medical devices, the beds, the chairs, the kitchenware, everything. Drive to the new location. And uh, they said, okay, that'll be $1,250. And the mom says, I don't have 1,250 bucks. They say, okay, call us when you get it. We'll bring it back, but there'll be another delivery charge. The family slept on the floor for several nights. Then they called our office. And we get about 40,000 calls a year. We can't bring suit on behalf of everybody who calls us. But on this one, my consumer chief came into my office with his hair on fire. And uh, we went to court the next day. Uh, we got an injunction that required the moving company to deliver the goods for 350 bucks. And then we thought, you know, maybe this isn't a one-off situation. So we subpoenaed all their books and records. We found they had done the same thing to every single one of their customers, nearly 400 of them. We got a judgment against them for $550,000, and we paid back all the people that they had cheated. The third case that I want to tell you about is an unfortunate sign of our times. Uh, it's about a young woman who worked in a restaurant, was raped by a coworker. She called the cops, they came, they arrested him, they took him to jail, and a day or two later, her husband got a call from the defendant's lawyer. And he said, look, um, you know, my client's here without papers. Uh, when he goes into the courtroom, ICE is gonna be there, and he's gonna say, what about your wife? She doesn't have papers either. So they're both gonna get deported. We ought to sit down and see if we can work this out. And the husband agreed to meet the lawyer. And uh, he went to the lawyer's office. And the lawyer had an interpreter there because the husband didn't speak English. And he said to the interpreter uh, and to the husband, 
let's all three of us put our cell phones out here at the front desk. We don't want a record of what we're going to say back in my office. And so they go back into the lawyer's office, and he repeats the same stuff. He says, you know, under Trump's laws now, um, they're both going to get deported. If your wife agrees not to show for trial and the case gets dismissed, we'll pay you a couple of thousand bucks. And P.S., you ought to treat him the way we used to treat people. Just take him out and beat him up. And uh, the good news is, unbeknownst to the lawyer, the husband has made his way to our office first. And so we had wired him up. And we have everything that the lawyer said on tape. <laughs> we've indicted the lawyer. We've indicted the interpreter for obstruction of justice. But something like that doesn't happen that often unless you have a leader who spews hate and sows fear, and that's unfortunately what we are dealing with uh, in Washington. And I think the past week uh, is another sad sign of these awful times. Um, the Attorney General of Maryland does not have what are called common law powers. That means unlike 41 other attorneys general, almost every elected attorney general in the country except for Maryland, um, an attorney general can go to court and sue on behalf of the people to protect their welfare, to protect the state. Uh, the Attorney General of Maryland needs either the governor's permission or needs the General Assembly to pass a law. And so in his first week in office, Donald Trump issued the first executive order, the Muslim ban, and I asked Governor Hogan to uh, give me permission to go to court to stop it. It's unconstitutional. And uh, I couldn't get an answer. So I turned to Eric Barron and Paul Pinsky and Jim Rosepep and uh, all the senators and delegates from Prince George's County and uh, around the state, and I said, help me out here. And as you all probably know, they're in session for 90 days a year. It takes them about 75 days to clear their collective throats. You know, they don't get a lot done. The bills don't get finally passed until the end of the session. But in this case, they passed a bill in two weeks. And so by the time of the second Muslim ban executive order, I was in court with the states of Washington, California, New York, Massachusetts, et cetera, and we've been in court ever since because Donald Trump is trying to tear apart the Affordable Care Act. You know, there are 450,000 people in our state who would have no insurance whatsoever but for the Affordable Care Act. There are millions more of us, especially old folks like me, with pre-existing conditions um, who would either not be able to get insurance at all or would pay a ton more for it uh, if we didn't have the Affordable Care Act. So we've sued the Trump administration to protect the Affordable Care Act and to protect Marylanders. Um, we've sued Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education. She keeps standing up for the predatory for-profit schools that take advantage of the most vulnerable people in the United States of America. We've sued the EPA because they're tearing apart the laws that protect our air, that protect our water, that protect us from toxic chemicals. And um, as, as Nicole said, uh, we've sued on the census because you know, they, we know that if uh, they ask the citizenship question, people won't answer, they won't respond. And guess what? That'll hurt blue states like Maryland, because that's where the immigrants are. And folks, even if they have green cards, even if they are new citizens, even if they're here with visas and here legally, they'll decline to answer, because there may be somebody in their family who could get in trouble, or they may just fear for themselves. Um, and this is designed to reduce the representation of blue states in Congress. It's designed to reduce the aid that we get from the federal government for health care, for transportation, for housing, and across the board. And uh, we've sued Donald Trump for violating our nation's original anti-corruption law, the emoluments clauses of the US Constitution. And I, I have to confess to you, I don't know about you, Nicole, but I slept through emoluments day in law school. <laughs> I, I retain nothing about it. Um, but uh, the foreign emoluments clause says that no federal official can receive any present or any emolument of any kind whatever from a foreign state. And the domestic emoluments clause says that the President of the United States gets his salary, which can't be raised or lowered, and no other emolument from the United States or any of them. And an emolument, we argue in our lawsuit, uh, is any, present, uh, any uh, gain, profit, or advantage. Um, and uh, Donald Trump violates both, both of those clauses every single day. 
He's got the Trump Post Office Hotel with a lease from the federal government. The lease itself says no elected federal official can receive any benefit from this lease. Uh, you know, Obama's head of GSA was asked when Trump was running, what if, what if he wins? Uh, what about the lease? And he said, oh, of course he'll have to divest himself. Trump fired that guy. He brought in somebody who looked at the lease and said, oh, you know, this is perfectly okay. So the Attorney General of the District of Columbia and I have sued him in Greenbelt in federal district court. And um, <laughs> the Justice Department moved to dismiss. Judge Peter Mercetti said, nah, this looks okay to me. Um, let's go forward with discovery. The Justice Department recently said, wait, stop. You know, we don't want, we want to give up his financial information. Um, you know, he's the President of the United States. He's too busy to stop violating the emoluments clauses. <laughs> um, let, let's hold it up, see what the Supreme Court thinks. We're waiting for the judge to rule on that motion, but I'm optimistic that we are going to be able to go forward. One more case I'll mention, which I think uh, is the cruelest thing that I have seen the United States government do in my lifetime. And that is to say to people who are fleeing for their lives from their home countries, you step across our border, we're gonna take your children away from you. And they're not doing it to protect national security. They're not doing it for public safety. They're doing it because they say it'll be a deterrent to stop people from coming across the border with their kids. And so they separated nearly 6,000. Okay, so we'll do a few parents. questions. Um, not a lot. We only have about 10 minutes because our attorney uh, general does have another engagement after this. Um, we are going to try to limit and, the questions to uh, one question per said, person. I got a couple of complaints after the last meeting about together. the number of questions. So we and do want to, A, limit the questions to one question per person. And then we do have to limit it to 10 minutes. I'll start here with Marjorie and then Reverend Ray and then Carl. They still is have hundreds yeah. of children that they okay. can't uh, well, reunite uh, with their parents. Well, this is about the you, uh, large number of the fire people every who came from Vietnam after the end of the war, decades, two decades ago, three decades ago, Let and who this in closing, have lived uh, here, and questions. most of them um, have become, I think I'm right, become citizens since then, seen, uh, and they have life. felt now, just recently, so insecure that it's affecting the the their lives rights. horribly. When of when one of, of my and friend was telling me, Kennedy woman, whose oldest son was, and was has just finished eight in years in the Air Force for and the United States, a couple and of hours for the younger the son who went to nursery school with our grandson. People didn't know. And there were no internet in those days. Uh, she Kennedy wanted to tell him the secret got so service teary, to she get could out hardly of town. talk they to me about strongly it. Advised and then the Washington speak. Post did a full but he went out, page he told the crowd in the A section of the maybe three, of three weeks ago, something like that, but Kennedy about goes on this, to say this. Uh, is happening in the United with States terror in the Vietnamese communities. And we have very large ones in this area, Virginia, Maryland, D.C. And I, I just think that there's some room here for an attorney general's another. office and a to of know about this and to uh, still take some country. action. Those are the things that my office stands for. Those are the things that we're gonna to continue to fight for. We are gonna to continue to protect Marylanders. We're gonna to continue to improve their lives and we're gonna to continue to fight for justice. Thank you very much for allowing me to do that. Thank you. Yes. Before, I, I forgot to mention that one of the leaders in the General Assembly on the bail reform issue was Eric Barron. Uh, he did an outstanding job raising the issue, fighting to get the system reformed, and I'm personally very grateful. Okay, so we'll do a few questions. Um, not a lot, we only have about 10 minutes because our Attorney General does have another engagement after this. Um, we are going to try to limit the questions to one question per person. I got a couple of complaints after the last meeting about the number of questions. So we do want to, A, limit the questions to one question per person, um, and then we do have to limit it to 10 minutes. I'll start here with Marjorie, and then Reverend Ray, and then Carl. Okay, um, is it working? Yeah, you, just for the recording. Okay, uh, well, uh, this is about the uh, large number of people who came from Vietnam after the end of the war, decade, two decades ago, three decades ago, and who have lived here 
and most of them have become, I think I'm right, become citizens since then. And they have felt now, just recently, so insecure that it's affecting their lives. Okay, thank you. Um, I know a lot of statistics come across your desk and uh, we see a lot of crime on television, but uh, I understand that crime in Prince George County has gone down. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I just want people to know that and we ain't so bad, right? <laughs> okay. Talk to me about it. And then the Washington Post did a full page in the A section of maybe three weeks ago, something like that, about this uh, happening with terror in the Vietnamese communities. And we have very large ones in this area, in Virginia and Maryland. DC. Right. And I, I just think that there's some room here for an attorney general's office to yeah. know about this and to uh, take some action. Yes. Uh, I don't know how uh, the Democratic attorneys general can keep up with the pace of the outrage yeah. coming out of the administration. I have two examples have not proceeded to being final rules, but we can anticipate they're coming. The science transparency rule right. that would gut the data EPA could use, and now the so-called affordable clean power plan. Right. I testified against both of those, and I have some data for you when you're done. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So we, we sued, uh, we're already in court over the clean power plan. They refused to implement the uh, Obama regulation. We're in court with other AGs to, to turn that around. We're making progress. Uh, the war on science goes on. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. But that's, that's what they're engaged in. I mean, I think the, I forget what the name of the committee was, the Science and Technology uh, Committee of the EPA. They hacked science out of the name because God forbid we should base our public policy on science. Yes, sir. Uh, the state attorney general in Pennsylvania has opened up an investigation of child sex abuse involving 300 Catholic priests uh, in the state. And I'm just asking if you have any plans to open an investigation regarding child sex abuse in the Catholic Church in Maryland. So the, the question was uh, the Attorney General of Pennsylvania prosecuting or did a large investigation about child sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. Are we doing anything about it? We don't announce that we're doing investigations, but uh, there are a number of things that I can tell you that are uh, in the public realm already. Uh, one is that if you go to our website, uh, there is a link on our front page under quick links, child sexual, child sexual abuse. Uh, if you click that link, there's a report that comes up that uh, allows you to contact our office. Uh, there's also a phone number and an email that can be used uh, to, to contact us uh, about it, especially with respect to uh, places of worship and schools. Uh, the second thing is that Archbishop Laurie the, uh, of the Archdiocese in, in Baltimore has issued a public statement to all the priests in the Archdiocese asking him to cooperate with the Maryland Attorney General's office in its, they, he calls, investigation. So while I can't, I can't uh, confirm or deny that's an investigation, that's in the uh, public realm. And I will say you know, that Josh Shapiro, who's the Attorney General of Pennsylvania, is a friend they did an outstanding job, uh, and they spent two years doing it without anybody whispering the word investigation and Catholic Church in the same sentence. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, Maryland has one of the better records when it comes to common sense gun legislation. What more needs to be done? And in working towards that, do we have to work something out with our neighboring states? Because we could be great, but if the other states are lax with this, then that creates problems for us as well. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I'm proudest of is that I led the Firearm Safety Act of 2013 through the General Assembly. And uh, it, it was best practices from all over the country. Fingerprint 
licensing. If you want to get a handgun, you must give your fingerprints to the state police. We do a deep background check, and, um, and it cuts down on straw purchases. Um, we ban the sale of assault weapons, large capacity magazines, and, and enacted a, a lot of other uh, important common sense gun safety measures. Um, the NRA challenged that. I was attorney general when they, when they challenged it. And so I had the opportunity not only to sponsor the legislation but also to defend it in court. On our assault weapons ban, we got the strongest decision in the country from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. They said these assault weapons ban, like the assault weapon that was used yesterday in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, um, they said these are weapons of war. They're not protected by the Second Amendment. Um, we would, if, if we had national standards that were the same as Maryland, we would be much, much, much better off if they just required background checks in our neighboring states and across the country, we would be better off in Maryland. Because what, what's happened since we passed the Firearm Safety Act is that the guns that are used in crimes are now not originating in Maryland. Most of the guns that are used in crimes in our state come from out of state because it's too hard to get them in state. If Pennsylvania and Virginia and some of West Virginia uh, had, had more sensible gun safety laws, it would make Maryland safer as well. If we could get national legislation passed, that would be fabulous. Yeah. Uh, my name's Evan Papp, and I'm in Riverdale. Uh, first off, thank you for all your service. You're doing a great job. In 2014, the Kansas State um, Attorney General, Chris Kobach, passed this uh, cross-check voter suppression policy that has been adopted by many states. I don't believe it's been applied to Maryland, but it was a decisive policy in Michigan, um, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin during the 2016 election, and Greg Pallas has written a lot about it, of what's going on in Georgia, Indiana, and Colorado. Yeah. So I I'm, I'm just would like to hear uh, how we can protect uh, all votes, and especially Democratic votes that right now are being suppressed. Well, you know, Chris Kobach was appointed head of uh, so-called voter fraud commission by Donald Trump. And the first thing they asked for was the enti our entire voter database. And, uh, and uh, I advised the Board of Elections to tell him absolutely not. So we did not turn it over to him. Ultimately, his, his commission collapsed um, because of outrage, not only from, from Democratic states, but also from Republican states who value uh, privacy and uh, and uh, the integrity of the elections. But uh, that said, Republicans are marching across the country to suppress the vote. And uh, North Dakota is the most recent, most egregious example. Um, they, uh, there's a very close Senate race there. And uh, they just issued a rule that says, if you have a uh, PO box as your address, you can't vote. You have to have a street address. And most of the folks who live on Indian reservations have P.O. boxes because they've got these dirt roads, winding roads, and everybody knows if you're on the reservation, everybody knows where everybody else is, but you don't have a street address. And they've done this in Wisconsin and a bunch of other states. You know, you have to show up with several different forms of identification, and you must have voted six times out of the last five elections. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, they're, they're doing everything they can to suppress the vote because they know that folks who are working people, who have to be at work, can't afford to take time off uh, to, to run through a multi-day drill to get the documentation uh, are the ones who are least likely to, to press on and vote, or at least able to press on and vote, and they're the ones who are mo most likely to vote Democratic. Um, and uh, in Maryland, we have very uh, solid voting laws. On your ballot this week and on November 6th, there's a proposition that will allow same-day registration on Election Day if you want to come in and vote. Um, I highly recommend that to you. Uh, you can register to vote when you go in to vote for the early vote, for the entire time of the early vote. And uh, it's, 
uh, it's a very easy process to go through. Also, we have the motor voter law. When you go to get your driver's license, they'll ask you if you want to register to vote. You can do it at the same time, and uh, it's very convenient. So the Democratic majority in the General Assembly has been very effective at, um, at encouraging people to vote in Maryland and making it easy. And the same needs, needs to be done nationwide. It's, it's the cornerstone of democracy in any effort to suppress it or obstruct it, I think, is a strike at our democracy. Um, I was going to talk about the, that PAC guy on the, F, what's it, the FCC about net neutrality repeal. Yeah. I was wondering if Maryland is doing anything about to, um, yes. uh, anything about it, basically, yes. the Attorney General. Um, yes, on net neutrality, we've joined a, a number of other AGs across the country to sue. We think it's an abuse of discretion. The FCC did a, a large number of studies, had multiple hearings on net neutrality, passed the rule, it's in effect, and then uh, Donald Trump gets elected, they go in and completely reverse the rule. Uh, they did no studies, they hear, had no hearings, uh, they, they just did it. We argue that it's arbitrary and capricious, violates the Administrative Procedures Act. That lawsuit uh, is still pending. Uh, other things that other states have done have been to pass their own net neutrality laws. Uh, there is a question about whether states can do that individually or whether it's preempted by the federal government, but since they don't have a law on net neutrality, I'm not sure they're preempting anything. So um, that, but that's an additional step that could be taken. It would have to be taken by the General Assembly. Uh, I've been informed that I can't, I can only ask one question, so I, I won't be asking the question that I would have asked about, <laughs> about the uh, county council's school ability to waive the school surcharge. You mentioned earlier that Maryland, unlike 41 other states that have their own elected attorney general, does not have constitutional authority to initiate litigation. And while there might be a good argument why you, Maryland's Attorney General should not have that authority. I'm inclined to think otherwise. And would that not be something for the General Assembly to take up as a proposed constitutional amendment in the coming session? Well, I would think generally uh, the Attorney General should have that authority. Thank you. Well, uh, you're in the majority uh, in that regard. It, it, it would have to be a constitutional amendment and the General Assembly could do it and put it on the ballot. Um, it's I mean, I'm, I'm very, sorry? I thought Delegate Barron might want that comment. Uh, well, I, th I think he's a smart guy. I'm pretty sure he already thought of it. But um, it would require a constitutional amendment. I have to say I am unimpeded now in terms of dealing with the, the Trump administration. Uh, I, I, that's not quite true. Legally, I'm, I, I have uh, the authority that we need to bring suit. The General Assembly also uh, appropriate or directed the, the governor to appropriate money to support our efforts, and despite that mandate, uh, he refused to put the money in the budget. That would be a huge help. We're working with existing resources now, and uh, somebody over here a few minutes ago said, you know, are you gonna be able to keep it up because there are so many terrible things uh, that are going on in the Trump administration. Uh, can you keep up? Sooner or later, we're, we're gonna run out. I mean, it's like playing whack-a-mole. There's a new thing or five every day. And, um, you know, we'll, we will need more resources, but up to now, we've been operating with the, the folks that we've got. They're working overtime, they're working nights and weekends, and we've gotten um, pro bono help from law firms and working with other attorneys general around the country, we've been able to keep it up. Um, so. So far, I think we're holding our own. All right, so last two questions, Lynn and then Cole. Thank you for endorsing Ben Jealous early. Yes. I want to know why the other big shot Democrats in our state have been so slow to do that, because it's not helping. I, I can't answer that question, but I would, <laughs> I would disagree with the other big shots. They're the big shots. I'm just, I'm just a lawyer. Uh, 
Thank, thank, thank you for your service. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the work that your office has been doing on gangs and the opioid yeah. crisis. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. The question is, what, what are we doing on gangs and the opioid crisis? So, as I said before, we, I set up the first organized crime unit in the history of the office, and that's what it was for. It was to focus on, on violence and uh, the opioid crisis. And on gangs, we've, we've indicted uh, members of the Bloods, the Crips, the Black Guerrilla family. We're, it's the first time the AG's office has, uh, has used the gang statute to uh, uh, file uh, actions against uh, folks who are engaging in drug trafficking, gun running, uh, and, uh, and violence. And we've been extraordinarily successful. Uh, the most recent two, at the beginning of September, we indicted one uh, four-member gang uh, that were carjacking. They would get control of folks' cars and beat them up anyway. They fractured one guy's skull, they shot at another. They, we, they were caught, I think, by the Baltimore City Police Department for one carjacking. They came to us uh, and, and asked us to continue the investigation. We connected them to 25 other uh, carjackings and thefts. And uh, they're now awaiting trial. Uh, right after that, we indicted a 13-member gang. I think they were affiliated with the Bloods. And um, they had been selling fentanyl, heroin, ecstasy, cocaine, and were engaging in violence uh, all over the metropolitan area. They were responsible for two murders, one of which we solved in the course of our investigation. It was a young man who had been celebrating his 27th birthday uh, and was walking home from the party was held up at gunpoint, gave him his wallet, they shot him to death anyhow. Um, we indicted a 26-member gang uh, that included two corrections officials. Um, and uh, they were, we, this is, you know, all of these are still pending, they're all charged, but in this one we allege in the indictment that the two corrections officials were ordering contraband coming in, going out, drugs coming in, cell phones coming in. They were ordering violence in the prison and outside the prison, uh, and it was all abetted by a couple of folks who, who worked there. We've had eight or 10 other uh, gang prosecutions. On, on opioids, um, not only, I mean, we've indicted these folks who were selling drugs on the street, we've also shut down a number of different pill mills. We found doctors who were selling prescriptions, uh, and we've put them behind bars. Uh, in one case, the owner of a pill mill uh, be, decided he wanted to go to trial. We convicted him. He was sentenced, and I think this is the first time in the state, he was sentenced as a drug kingpin. Previously, that had only been used with respect to people who were selling drugs on the street, but they were doing as much damage, leaving a trail of addiction and death as, as uh, much as the folks who were selling it on the street. Sued uh, one of the opioid manufacturers were in an, an investigation with other attorneys general around the country of all the other manufacturers and distributors. Um, so we're approaching it on a number of different levels. How is bail reform working in Prince George's County? So I saw a report that it's not working as well as expected in Prince George's County. Um, it is working across the state. I mean, across the state, we've made huge steps forward. Um, one, one way of measuring is whether we have more people in jail or fewer people in jail, and we have many fewer since the rule went into effect. Um, it's dropped, from people who were held after their uh, initial appearance dropped from 51% to 43%. And that means somewhere between 10 and 13,000 people a year are not being held in jail uh, prior to trial as they were previously. Uh, I understand that in Prince George's County, at least one study sh said that uh, it wasn't working that way here. Um, elsewhere around the state, the, um, and there are three metrics. One is who's in jail and who isn't. Second would be, are people showing up for trial or are they failing to appear? Um, the failure to appear rate has remained static since the uh, uh, bail rule was put in effect. So, you know, we're, we're uh, having fewer people in jail and same number of people showing up for trial. Uh, the third question is whether people are committing violent acts or committing crimes when they're on release. 
the judiciary wasn't collecting that information beforehand. They don't seem to be able to uh, collect it yet. Um, I can tell you that in jurisdictions that have robust pretrial systems, they're extraordinarily successful, way more successful than uh, the state as a whole is. And Montgomery County and St. Mary's County, two very different jurisdictions, have these systems. And instead of, instead of holding people while they're awaiting trial, their uh, presumption is people are going out, they're gonna supervise them uh, on the outside maybe wearing a GPS device, maybe having to check in with a parole officer uh, three times a week, pee in a cup once a week, whatever. Um, they, um, Montgomery County and St. Mary's County both have failure to appear rates in the low single digits, around 3%. The statewide average is 10%. They have offense rates, low single digits, um, and again, around 3%. And it's because they screen the people effectively they supervise them effectively, and besides delivering better justice, the taxpayers save a ton of money. We, you know, it costs us 10 times as much to keep somebody behind bars as it does to supervise them on the outside. So uh, we, you know, the taxpayers are, are making out great. It can be improved, it needs to be improved in Prince George's County from what I hear, um, and there's a lot of room for improvement uh, across the state. I think it can be done. I'm hoping the General Assembly will come in this year, set up a program to make sure that counties are investing in appropriate pretrial uh, assessments, and uh, I think you'll see dramatic improvements uh, continue. All right, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Um, before you go, <laughs> Thank you. You're a rock star, so. <laughs> um, but before you leave, a couple of things. One, um, Conrad, if you can come up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, we know that you're in the middle of a very heated campaign, um, and we know that money, unfortunately, is the root oh, of all does. evils as it relates to campaign, but you need money in order to make sure you're getting your message out there across the state. And so we wanted to give you a small contribution um, of $500 from the wow. club um, just to support your Thank efforts. You Thank you guys very much. <laughs> we'll put it to good use, I can promise you that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Well, no problem. Right. No I'll problem. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.